Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping bits and pieces. If you have any technical issues, uh, please send a short message in the question box, which you should find on the right hand side of your screen, and we'll try to um, answer them and help you get online. During the webinar, RSSL would like to invite you to ask questions, also using that question box on the right hand side. And at the end of the webinar, time permitting, we will try to answer as many of these as possible. Any we don't get around to answering, we will answer offline and we'll share them with you along with a copy of the slides. So today's webinar is about keeping environmental monitoring relevant and fine tuning that program. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Annette Russell and I'm the sterile and non-sterile microbiology lead at RSSL. I've worked in the commercial team at RSSL for over six years, connecting our clients to our technical experts in order to support them in a wide variety of projects. RSSL can support you from early phase R&D of your drug product all the way through to commercialization, as well as supporting you during the manufacturing process. If you want any further information after the webinar, please just contact me using the details you can see on your screen now. For those of you who are new to RSSL and these webinars, who are we? So RSSL have been around for over 30 years and we're based exclusively in the Reading area. For those of you that don't know where Reading is, it's about 40 miles west of London and Heathrow in the UK. We have over 250 scientists working for us and supporting our clients in 12 different technical areas of which microbiology is one of them. We have won many awards for our flexibility as a CRO, but also for our culture of supporting and developing our staff. So RSSL's diversity means that we are able to support many different client projects. And especially in the case of this webinar and around Annex 1 regulations, we can support you with your environmental monitoring, your disinfectant validation, sterility testing, as well as the, the routine raw material testing or vial and stopper testing you may require. But we can also help with the training of your personnel because we have a dedicated training department. Well, that's enough of me. Let's get on to our guest speaker today. So today we have Dr. Tim Sandor, who I'm sure many of you have heard of and I'm sure you subscribe to his many publications. So Tim has over 25 years experience of microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. Tim is a member of several editorial boards and he has written over 600 book chapters, peer reviewed papers and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and also finds time to be a visiting tutor at both the University of Manchester and UCL. So I'm going to hand you over to Tim now. Okay, um, thank you very much. Annette. Okay, uh, can you see my screen okay? Yep, it's fine. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, welcome everybody. And it's a great pleasure to be back with you um, again. And um, with this um, webinar, this is part of our series of um, deep diving into um, Annex 1 and some of the um, inferences and, and pointers that we can draw from the from the annex, we, we, we felt it was useful to look at environmental monitoring and environmental control because that is um, uh, apparent in, in a number of areas in, in, in the annex. But we wanted to look at some of the um, finer points that the annex is, is indicating and some of the best practices that we need to consider. And in doing so, we also need to uh, look at some of the um, weaknesses around environmental monitoring and the greater emphasis upon environmental control. Um, so in drawing out some of the key considerations, we've got this reference to Annex 1, some of the key considerations of the contamination control 
strategy. And we also wanted to consider what can monitoring show? What do we need risk assessment for? What are the consequences of doing poor risk assessments and how that can undermine what we're, what we're trying to seek with a control and monitoring strategy? What the data signals and, um, and also what can lead to bad data in terms of method limitations and, and so on. Um, but we begin with considering um, what monitoring um, can show. So environmental monitoring can be very powerful in terms of signaling change. Um, but this power is only really apparent when a large amount of data is collected. And in collecting that data, it's, it, it's partly about the volume of data, but it's also about repetition as well. So we need to be know that we're drawing our data from um, similar sampling points taken at, at similar frequencies under similar representative or, or worst case um, conditions. And then assessing that mass of data over time. Um, so the, the power of monitoring is there when the uh, data's of, of sufficient quantity, but also where locations have been appropriately selected and the frequencies of which we're monitoring is meaningful. But it also stands that um, environmental monitoring is no substitute for control. And environmental monitoring cannot and should not be used to cover up poor practices. So we need to ensure that we've got good design of our clean rooms and our processes and our training and our operator behaviours and of our qualifications and of our ongoing um, physical controls. And only when we've got all of that right does monitoring become more meaningful. It's also really important that environmental monitoring is risk-based. And as we've mentioned before in these webinars, um, we see the term quality risk management repeated at a very high rate throughout the revised annex. So we need to consider risk and there will be um, different tools and methods that we can draw upon for this purpose. And a suitable um, method uh, to consider is the use of hazard analysis and critical control points or the HACCP methodology. There are of course others that can be looked at, but the process flow approach and the prompt to stop and consider what sources of contamination are, what potential vectors uh, for contamination and what suitable control and monitoring could be applied make, makes HACCP quite a powerful tool for that purpose. Um, and then an effective risk-based uh, environmental monitoring system should be formed of um, key parts and I've, I'll put through those parts on the slide. So first of all there's the identification of all potential microbiological contamination sources and routes of contamination in the environment. So that's um, where can contamination occur? How can contamination be moved around? How can it end up where we don't want it to end up? And this also will include um, selected microorganisms of interest. Secondly, there's assessing the risk from these sources and the um, modes of transmission and how we then improve or introduce for the first time, if, if, if we haven't done so already, uh, appropriate microbiological contamination control methods to reduce the identified risks. And then there's the uh, repetition element, establishing a monitoring schedule, using appropriate sampling methods in order to monitor contamination at source or to verify the effectiveness of a control method or perhaps both. And in order to um, strengthen that approach, then um, it's important that we establish appropriate alert and action levels. And 
we know within uh, the revised annex that there's a particular sort of newer emphasis given to the alert level and using the alert level to signal improvements to prevent um, action level excursions from occurring. Uh, we also need to be undertaking verification on a continuing basis uh, to give us confidence that the microbial contamination system is effective and it's meeting the uh, generally agreed performance um, parameters and that's by reviewing product contamination rates, environmental monitoring results, verifying the robustness of the risk assessment method, looking at control methods and monitoring limits and where appropriate modifying those accordingly. And we'll look at some of those elements uh, shortly. But it's also about um, establishing and maintaining appropriate documentation. Like, like anything um, in, in, in pharmaceuticals, everything needs to be documented, the program, the capture of the data, the analysis, the results, and so on. We also need to consider the um, education and training of, of staff involved um, in terms of those who take samples and those who are behaving in, in particular ways that we want to minimize contamination. And risk um, also helps us um, to uh, improve the monitoring program and it infuses through various elements of the program. So it helps us to identify um, sources and vectors of contamination. It helps us to um, identify appropriate monitoring points and in particular those locations that will inform us um, directly of transfer to, to product and thereby of product quality. And here we need to consider the most appropriate um, methods to use. And risk-based thinking can also help us answer questions about appropriate sample sizes um, or how long a monitoring session needs to be for. And also allow consideration of the time of monitoring and for um, durations of monitoring. And um, among the types of tools we've already uh, mentioned, I've already mentioned HACCP, um, but there's also um, things like uh, risk assessments, uh, matrices that we can look at. And if, if we consider just this example um, on the slide, that this is a type of framework that can be used to be look at, look at different locations and to consider the likely uh, levels of contamination or actual levels of contamination, but then also consider factors like the ease of dispersion, then the probability of contamination ingressing where we don't want it to, we say it could be into, into a vessel or directly into a, a product vial, and then also to come up with a comparative risk rating. So we can start to order and sort um, environmental monitoring locations and ensure that we're picking locations based on like levels of contamination and um, dispersion um, factors as well. And you could in, in this sort of example perhaps um, add or multiply those um, factors together in order to come up with a risk rating and embark on some form of uh, risk prioritization. So it's a way of um, offering a sort of more meaningful structure to the uh, environmental monitoring um, program. But of course, with anything that, that, that's too um, highly uh, theorized, that, that, that there's always the element of variability. And our biggest area of variability is always going to be with people because they are the most unpredictable factor operating within the clean room. And uh, there's obviously schools of, of um, published literature that, that indicates that people are the primary source of contamination within the clean room, and that's because most of the microorganisms detected uh, in clean room air and then settling onto surfaces have originated from the 
deposited uh, skin detritus from personnel. Um, and people are capable of dispersing uh, a large number of um, particles, even when they're appropriately um, gowned. So we need to strengthen gown controls and strengthen um, behaviours and introduce as much ways of habitual careful, careful working as possible as a way of minimising this, this sort of uncertainty that we need to factor into the um, risk-based thinking. Um, and having said that, it's also important to consider where, where environmental monitoring uh, risk assessments can go wrong and what the consequences are of undertaking um, poor risk assessments. Um, so a badly conceived risk assessment will simply not work. And certainly any kind of risk assessment to start with that, that sets out to determine what the outcome is in advance is a bad idea. So the worst thing, the worst approach would be to go into a room to begin a risk assessment exercise and say, right, how do we get this as a low risk? That, that's completely the wrong um, approach to start with. Um, risk assessments can also be flawed if the input data is a, in itself flawed. So if the data is missing something important to give it um, context, so counts have gone up, why did those counts go up? Well, maybe we changed the shift pattern, but if we're not factoring that in, then, then our thinking analysis around that data is going to be flawed. Um, or we may be wrongly assessing something. We might be looking at data, trying to work out what's happened, assuming that um, there was one person in the room without appreciating that on that occasion there were five people in the room. So we need to give data context and to get as much um, supporting and metadata uh, as, as possible. Uh, we also need to be sure that we're as specific as possible. So some risk assessments can be too idealised. So um, if we take clean room design, it would be wrong to to say, for example, all of our clean rooms are of, of, of this type of performance. They've all got the same type of grade of HEPA filter, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in reality, um, not every clean room is the same. And that's particularly so with um, one of the sort of uh, newer Annex 1 requirements, which is the recovery rate. So that's how long does it take a clean room to recover from a high particle dispersing event. And that is going to vary um, considerably between different clean rooms uh, because it's a factor of, of not only air coming in and air going out, but also of people and equipment and of the air patterns within the room itself. Um, there are um, other things that impinge upon uh, risk assessments that can lead to weaker or poorer risk assessments. So this can occur where we're not looking at uh, risk um, holistically, or at least how um, different elements uh, interlink. So if, we're, if we have, say, contamination in uh, a grade D area, and we're, and we're just focusing on that level of contamination in grade D, but we're not considering what's going on in clean rooms of higher grades, so say into a grade C area, uh, and we're not looking at the more sort of subtle data fluctuations, then we might be missing a contamination um, event. And this also connects with um, not giving um, adequate consideration to the various um, vectors as well. Um, so we need to consider um, air in particular. So understanding airflow and air distribution is, is, is very important for establishing risk assessments and as is um, material transfer, particularly how we move people and equipment into and out of clean rooms, particularly clean rooms of different 
grades and this becomes increasingly important as we move through the higher grades of clean rooms and particularly where we're engaging in aseptic processing. Uh, risk assessments can be poor if they're not um, data driven, if they're not based on scientific and technical information. Um, they can also be weak if they're not reactive to change and particularly things like change control. So um, we may have established risk assessments, but when we introduce a change, we need to revisit those risk assessments. And often where it's things with clean room design or, or process alterations, there may well be an impact upon contamination control and the monitoring program. And then failing to review risk assessments regularly in, in itself um, can lead to things being missed and slippage and, um, and so on. Um, I just want to just return to that subject of um, transference as well though, um, because a good risk assessment program will be one that's mindful of um, the transfer of um, paper and materials, and especially uh, looking to understand um, how contamination can move from one location to another. And here there are um, some particular um, known points of weakness, so transfer hatches and we know again the annex is trying to strengthen that through the uh, new requirement to have localized airflow but that's still an activity where there's an element of, of risk changing rooms and um, airlocks as well all become uh, fundamental um, areas of um, pushing contamination in the wrong direction and then within the clean room, as we mentioned, we've got understanding um, air. Most contamination within the clean room will have originated as airborne contamination. And that's whether it remains suspended in the air or eventually becomes deposited onto um, surfaces. Um, risk assessments are also um, weak. Um, if they put too much emphasis upon environmental monitoring having good detectability. So environmental monitoring in general has um, fairly weak detectability. Um, for the first part, it's always looking backwards. But it also stands that uh, the um, sample sizes are always going to be small. So simply running one uh, active air sample at one point of time is only going to have sampled a very, very tiny amount of air within the clean room. Uh, we know that there's an existence of a number of organisms that are simply not culturable. There's other organisms that may well be culturable under one set of conditions, but the uh, stresses of the clean room environment render them non-culturable when we're trying to recover them. Um, a lot of the um, environmental monitoring methods are somewhat limited and we're going to have a look at those in, um, in a short while. And also the um, limits of detection are um, never as um, precise as, as, as we might imagine. So few environmental monitoring methods have um, detectability below um, 10 CFU. And uh, so we always have all these factors that we need to consider. So this is why when we're undertaking um, risk assessments, and if you think about the classic approach to risk assessments of being a each identifiable hazard, being a combination of severity and occurrence, it's, it's far more important to put the emphasis upon what is the severity, what is the occurrence or likelihood, and then trying to control that because our ability to detect is always going to be um, flawed to a degree. Having said that, we can strengthen our program through um, the use of, of, of collecting uh, a large volume of data and looking at that data over time. 
And there's a number of things we can do with the data, and it's often that we can strengthen the interpretation of environmental monitoring data if we're looking at that data in more than one way. So we can consider the counts um, obtained, uh, and, and that's really important, and particularly the way the annex is, is established in terms of looking at counts against um, limits. It's just that um, the, the lower the count, potentially um, the less accurate the result is. And we also have to um, be mindful that um, just because we're seeing a single colony, it doesn't necessarily mean that that only arose from one microorganism. So if we have a settle plate and it grows one colony from one uh, skin particle that's landed on it, um, it's more often the case that there's three or four microorganisms per skin particle rather than the one. So potentially we've got that a slight underestimation, but counts are important. As are um, assessing things in terms of um, alert levels, as are looking at patterns of um, zero and non-zero events, and we can establish by looking at data over time what is the, the sort of normal pattern or normal frequency. So if our hit rate increases, that, that in itself is a sign of uh, a breakdown of control. And we also need to study the types of microorganisms that we are finding as well, because there's a lot of valuable information we can draw from um, microbial identification and the trending of clean room isolates. And again, this is something that the revision to Annex 1 alludes to. And it, it's um, asking there for um, all organisms in grade A and B areas to be characterized and for a risk-based program to be in place for other clean rooms. And, that, and that's quite important because um, the identification of clean room isolates um, helps us to look for changes to the norm. And when we get changes to the norm, we can try and work out why they might be occurring. So it could be signaling uh, concerns with cleaning and disinfection. It could be a, a new team who's involved in that activity. Um, we might have serious events like sterility test failures, where a wider array of data and, and perhaps introducing some genotypic identification can strengthen the program. And we also can get clues of the origin of um, organisms as well by understanding what species they are. And we can also strengthen um, the testing of our culture media and to do things and go back and periodically assess disinfectants if we understand um, what the array and types of organisms that we are finding. So it's all about expanding the test panel for growth promotion or the inclusion of environmental isolates, for example. Um, but also identification data um, is important for um, problem solving and investigation. And um, although we need to be careful of too many generalizations, it can be that the um, microorganisms might have a direct association with people, and that's often the case with the staphylococci and micrococci. We might have an indication of contamination coming in from equipment or um, from things like trolley wheels, which could be the case with bacterial spores. And we may have contaminants that are associated with water or perhaps indicating uh, poor hygiene practices, which could be the case with gram-negative bacteria, and here we can divide gram-negative bacteria into those that have more of a likely uh, origination from water and those which might be more uh, in enteric. And where we're um, particularly working in um, upstream processing or in non-sterile um, manufacturing, we need to consider whether an organism um, is objectionable as well. 
So um, we here need to look at various factors, including the pathogenicity of the organism um, and what certain numbers of that organism might present to the spoilage of a non-sterile product or an incoming uh, raw material for sterile or non-sterile process. Um, there may be factors here like water activity, uh, likely uh, growth patterns, um, if it's a non-sterile product in terms of characterizing the preservative um, system, um, but also for raw materials, what, what, what that presence of what might, uh, that organism might do in, in that situation. So there's some other factors to consider as well. Um, and then returning to the subject of um, data, and as I said, data um, underpins the, uh, a lot of the environmental monitoring program. Our robustness of our data is dependent upon um, the number of samples that we're taking and the frequency at which we're taking those samples. So that's something um, I mentioned earlier. Um, and it would be in most cases for most clean rooms for most locations, unless we're really sampling weekly or more often, we're unlikely to draw a big enough data set that is um, meaningful. So I know that some places will be doing um, or conducting monthly monitoring and um, obviously there's going to be, there's obviously resource implications and so on, but um, 12 data points a year isn't really um, giving us a, a suitable picture. Um, we also need suitable locations. And, and, and again, we've touched upon that with um, the earlier sort of HACCP discussions, um, but the locations really need to inform about um, risk in some form, be that risk uh, to product and processes or risk to practices and behavior such as cleaning or uh, people movements. Um, we also need to have a degree of confidence that those taking the samples are sufficiently competent to do so, so that they are able to do so in a way that's avoiding false positives or um, in some way, say, not doing the sample in the right place that, that might Decrease, introduce a degree of variability or inaccuracy into the process. And similarly with sample custody as well, we need to understand that the sample is well looked after and um, cross-contamination is avoided. There's also going to be factors um, that will affect the reliability of the data as well. So the type of culture media that we're using for environmental monitoring, we need to um, ask ourselves whether it's um, suitable for the clean room and whether it is capable of growing those organisms that are going to be theoretically present in the clean room. So there's no point using a medium that's suitable for some aspect of the microbial limits test and, and not using a medium that's um, suitable for the clean room. And, and although, um, in, in many cases, um, tryptophan soy agar is the uh, universally most common and, and that is generally an appropriate medium. Not all types of TSA are the same. So there are sometimes issues with the suitability of the quality of even the same types of culture media. So some um, uh, manufacturers of um, TSA are quite weak at growing streptococci, for example. So we're already losing then uh, a data understanding if we were concerned about mass control, for example. Um, th there's also questions about whether we use one or two culture medium, whether it's say just TSA or TSA in combination with another medium like SDA. And, that, and the answer to that will depend upon um, the validation of our culture media. Um, there are then similar considerations for incubation parameters, so the length of time that plates are incubated for, and the uh, temperature. And again, with um, a single medium, whether that's a, a one temperature or a dual temperature, and then an order of temperature issue. And um, 
There's not necessarily any right or wrong answer to that. That's going to be partly dependent upon um, where in the world we are, what grades of clean rooms and what types of organisms um, are likely to be present or are found to be present from trying out different um, regimes. We also need to understand the uh, suitability of equipment and the techniques that go into um, using the equipment and that in itself can affect um, data and we'll have a look at that in just a couple of minutes. We also need to uh, be selecting appropriate forms of trend analysis. So um, there is no point carrying out lots of environmental monitoring if we're not going to collect the data and put in appropriate time to review these data and consider um, what we can draw from those data patterns. Um, so there are different methods by which we can trend data. We can use um, XY charts, whether it's a Stewart charts or cumulative um, sum charts. But for the most part, unless we're dealing with very, very specific uh, batch related aseptic filling monitoring, it's generally the case that individual results are really going to tell us all that much. And the most important elements are always going to come from um, looking at the bigger picture, looking at a wider data set. So changes in trends need to be uh, documented and investigated. So if we take the, the chart on the screen, on, on the earlier part of the chart on the left hand side up to say around 521, there's a lot more activity than there is on the latter part of the chart. So that would have required um, some level of investigation and it may have included things like uh, undue uh, higher levels of maintenance work in an area, which could be say opening up parts of the facility that are not normally exposed within the clean room, such as panels. It can relate to disinfection, it can relate to unusual events or activities. It could be a physical change uh, to a parameter such as um, temperature or humidity, or it could be a weakness, say, with something like staff training. But to ensure that we're um, reacting to data correctly, we need to um, set appropriate alert levels. And again, this is another driver from um, Annex 1. Um, and we also may wish to consider um, numbers of excursions and patterns of excursions within that. Um, it might be with some trend analysis tools be appropriate to um, remove um, outliers, but any uh, approach to do that needs to be done very, very carefully and with good justification. And that outlier should never be hidden from the data set. So it might need to appear in a table, but if it's going to be removed from a graph for clarity, then that needs to um, be very, very clearly justified and, and, and avoid any charges of hiding um, data. Now, with the um, environmental monitoring methods, there are some considerations that can help us to um, strengthen those methods and uh, make them more robust. So active air samplers, there, there are a range of different types, filtration, impaction, centrifugal as, as kind of core examples, but even the same type of air samplers do not work in the same way. So all air samplers have different cutoff efficiencies or what's called the D50 value. And the D50 value is the size at which half of the particles are collected and half pass through. And that will always relate to a size and generally the smaller the size then the more effective that air sampler is. So we need to select air samplers with D50 values for low particle sizes 
And we also need to uh, verify that the manufacturer has assessed the biological collection efficiency of the air sampler as well. And we ourselves need to know that um, any impact on media dehydration when the air sampler is working is minimal and that the air sampler is itself not disrupting our airstream. With saddle plates, we need to try and tie the locations to something meaningful. And here, airflow visualization studies can be very effective. And we also need to qualify that the exposed plate over the four hour time period that Annex 1 requires does not lead to excessive dehydration or plate damage so that any microorganisms are recoverable. For contact plates, we can standardize to a degree by controlling the time and the method of application, the sort of classic rolling method. There are also some devices that can help us to control pressure, but perhaps the most important aspect is having the right type of neutralizer because there are bound to be disinfectant residues on the surface and we need to avoid um, false negative results. And just as an aside, the issue of residues, which again features in Annex 1, is increasingly becoming a hot topic, especially where there is a risk of one disinfectant interfering with another. Um, so we do need to understand and where appropriately risk assess the process of removing residues um, as well. And that's not so much from the environmental monitoring perspective, because we, we may have a regular neutralizer, but it is in terms of the potency of a disinfectant and the risk of, of inactivating that disinfectant. With um, swabs, we can uh, get far better swab recoveries if we're using flock swabs over plain swabs. And there's um, swabbing is very um, application and operator technique um, dependent. So good training in, 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 in swab sampling. And then also then with processing the swab, whether we are plating the swab out or um, using a membrane filtration method, we need to try and use the method that will give us the highest recovery of microorganisms. With um, particle um, counting, um, we need to um, ensure that we can um, understand the patterns from particle data. So we're um, drawing, uh, we just draw upon a lot of continuous monitoring data, but equally understand certain activities that might be of a, a lower risk, such as door opening, understand the effect of numbers of people in the room, and understand um, the impact of things like uh, glove disinfectant and so on. So it's, it's about building a wider picture of the particle counting um, data. Furthermore, it's also important that for that data to be meaningful, that we understand the location that the particle counter is positioned in, that it's close to the main activity, and we're not simply just using counters based on classification, but they're actually positioned according to the greatest risk, and that the um, sampling probe is orientated in the right direction, that our tubing is not too long to avoid um, dropout of, of particles and, and, and Annex 1 um, in one of the earlier drafts did actually um, have information on tubing length and the radius of the um, tubing and, and their important factors to consider. We also need to be careful not to damage particle counters by doing things like spraying glove spraying into them and also be uh, mindful that particle counters can themselves sometimes generate um, particles as well. We can also uh, boost and strengthen our program through um, 
careful sampling and ensuring that we are training in sampling techniques um, and to avoid um, particularly introducing contamination through the act of sampling and, and this obviously becomes a big issue um, in uh, aseptic um, processing where we can get disruption so maintaining first air principles is is really important and sometimes sampling can be um, in, in itself a um, dangerous activity so let's come on to the final part of the uh, webinar before we go to questions and there are um, some other parts of the program that can be um, strengthened so the first thing is that is that shutdowns have an enormous impact on a facility um, so it's good to perhaps sometimes increase the amount of environmental monitoring we do prior to a shutdown so we can understand what the baseline contamination level is we may want to do some monitoring during a shutdown particularly if we have concern over spores so we can get a feel for how that contamination level has been elevated and then um, we'd want to do again perhaps a period of extensive monitoring coming out of a shutdown so we can gather as much data more data and having data more quickly available as to the impact of our maintenance work and our cleaning and our disinfection practices um, similarly with maintenance work um, again this is disruptive it often um, involves introducing risks that are not normally there in clean rooms and say we've got closed processes we could be opening some of those up or where we've got open processing we could be increasing the level of um, particles within a room so we need to understand the impact of those works and we need to understand how we're going to do the post activity cleaning and disinfection um, another thing with the, the monitoring program is that we need to understand the impact of, of change so where we do do things like change shift patterns let's say we, a facility goes 24 7 or we wish to vary room occupancy or we might want to increase throughput or we're making changes to um, equipment type and design then they're all things we need to evaluate and react to and we might need to change our program to match that we may need to change location so we're near a new piece of equipment we may want to do things more frequently so we can get a faster feel of the impact of that piece of equipment for example um, we also need to um, react to data appropriately if it's signaling something so if we see a step change in particle counts this might eventually lead to um, an increase of frequency or we might want to do a higher frequency where we're trying to evaluate the outcome of a corrective or a preventative um, action um, we also may need to do more locations in order to assess the effectiveness of an action and we also would need to consider um, different forms of monitoring if something is obstructing us from carrying out the monitoring so if we have a process that uses powder that might make um, the use of a particle counter inappropriate or if we have a area where there's um, strong health and safety things around electrics like a, an atex rated area then rather than saying well we're not going to do any monitoring because of these reasons we would need to consider an alternative so we may want to use more settle plates uh, as examples in those um, situations um, we also need to try and build a robust program um, by considering rapid microbiological methods and again there's a, a nudge within annex one towards that so it's looking for methods that are more sensitive accurate precise and reproducible and in particular with the environmental monitoring clean room space the um, work that, that that's happened around spectrophotometric counters that have the ability to differentiate between uh, inert and, and viable particles can be um, a very useful add-on or looking at things like weaknesses around airlocks or numbers of people in changing rooms another important 
consideration that um, helps strengthen the, the program and the data is itself data integrity. Um, so we need to obviously ensure the quality of our computer inputted data. We also need to um, protect our plates as well. So are we recording information that's contemporaneous about the time taken, who by, et cetera? The accuracy of plate counting, how well people can count colonies, the, the light source, the use of a magnifier. And also, um, if we see plate shrinkage, uh, plate cracking, damage, and so on. They're all factors that we can consider to strengthen that, that data input. And similarly with um, computerized systems as well. Um, so that say the operation of a particle counter we need to have good definitions of data to define what is original data. Uh, there be things like password controls and audit trails, but also ensuring things like clocks are accurate and calendars are accurate that we can really connect the data that we gather to the actual events and, and things that were occurring when we took the uh, particle counts. OK, so this is my final um, slide. Uh, another thing that can help support the program and we can draw uh, meaningful um, inferences from are some of the physical data aspects as well. So uh, room temperatures, and if room temperatures fluctuate, uh, especially if temperatures go up, that can affect microbial survival. Changes to humidity as well has um, an impact upon microbial growth, and these factors can also impact upon the, um, the operator as well, and how well suits work, and masks work, and, and, and so on. So these are all um, important um, elements to add to other physical data, like pressures, and to the overall environmental monitoring um, program. So there was a lot of information. Um, there's um, a lot of different nuances, but hopefully been able to entice out that there's different ways through which we can enhance the environmental monitoring program and, and make it more meaningful to meet the spirit of Annex 1. So I'll uh, hand you over to back to Annette. Thank you, Tim. Just while we flick the slides over here, um, I've got some questions that have come through. Um, so I have one from Nicola, and she said, what is your opinion on setting alert levels where the majority of results are zero and data does not lend itself to be sorry, to statistical analysis? OK, um, certainly. Um, if you try and use um, approaches like normal distribution, um, that that's not suitable for uh, environmental monitoring data. Um, you can make attempts to transform the data to see if it will resemble something that's a little bit more normal, but that often um, doesn't work. So um, personally, I think a technique like the percentile cutoff approach um, is uh, far better, um, but you need to make sure that um, you've got a fairly big data set for that purpose. So ideally you want something like a, a thousand results plus um, in order to make that work. On, on a similar sort of um, similar sort of question, um, Brett has asked for trend analysis, is Excel usable for doing this or is it not okay because of data integrity um that's yeah it's a kind of an interesting double question really so is excel suitable yes excel is perfectly um suitable um does excel meet data integrity um to a degree it does so there's actually some good supporting information from microsoft about uh, Excel and data integrity, um, but it's important to set up a validated spreadsheet so that there's various checks that can be done. And so it's possible to check all the formula and, and to go through due process there. It just leaves the 
sometimes variable of people inputting data. So um, whether a second check is required would, would obviously depend upon your local um, practices. But Excel in itself is, is a very powerful tool. Okay, and I have one from Pooja who said, what different environmental monitoring sampling is required when it comes to viral vector suites beside the air sampling contact and settle plates? Um, so viral uh, viral controls and biosafety is a very specialised um, area. Um, th there are forms of monitoring that can be done, but but it's less um, normal to um, assess the environment. It's much more about the uh, controls around the product and the viral inactivation steps that are involved in the um, production of the product. So it would be um, more around the um, techniques like solvent detergent, uh, pH, heating, nanofiltration, and so on, and then testing the, the finished product for particular viruses of concern. There, there are specialized air samplers available, but, but it's less typical to go down that path. Right, okay. And I, I've got a question myself. Uh, what are the risks you mentioned about that come out of um, a facility shutdown? Um, I mean, it depends what what goes on, but th there's always going to be um, different degrees of risk. So if, even if it involves um, uh, changing ceiling grills it is probably the is, is one thing. But then if you're taking HEPA filters down and replacing them, you're opening up ceiling voids. If um, more extreme things, new equipment coming in, if there's drilling, sometimes walls are knocked down, sometimes floors are replaced. So each one of these things can um, provide a, a risk of bacterial spores because there's more likely bacterial spores present in the fabric somewhere and, and uh, bacterial spores can last almost indefinitely. Or if we're opening up parts of a facility where it might get temporarily exposed to the outside environment, then there's risk of fungal spores um, coming in and then all this presents a lot of challenges in the cleaning and disinfection process so um, there are technologies like VHP that can be used uh, or you can do various rounds of manual disinfection with sporocytes but it's really understanding what that impact is and, and the point I was saying about you may want to intensify the environmental monitoring coming out of the shutdown to give a degree of of verification that you're back in control. Okay, well, I think we've we've run out of time now. Um, thanks uh, again, Tim, for a very informative webinar there. Um, to everybody out there attending, if your question didn't get responded to, um, we will forward them on to Tim to answer offline. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'll send them out with a copy of the slides. Um, if you'd like to catch any of the future webinars that Tim's going to deliver for us, uh, you'll see on the screen the, the next four months worth of webinars that we've got planned. Um, please go to our website where you can register for these. And you'll also see that we uh, do a variety of different training courses that we can help support you through Annex One. Um, these are delivered by our training team who have a, a access to a pool of consultants that are actually working out there in the industry and they can be um, tailor-made to you if required. Finally, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.